you stand with me today as we do around here just as we're getting ready to pay reverence to the Word of God. We're going we're gonna to start part three of this sermon series called Against the Grain, Against the Grain. Everybody, everybody do this. In fact, point at somebody, point, point, point at somebody, point. Yeah, you did it, you did it, you did it. You made me late for church, you did it, you did it. <laughs> You did it. You tried to talk, to talk us out of coming this morning. We, you did it. You wanted to go to Cracker Barrel. I, I said, no, let's go to church. You did it. You did it. Now, now, I want you to look at the three fingers pointing back at you. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, the three finger, fingers pointing back at you. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, against the grain. We've been talking about being against the grain in the world, but how about against the grain in ourselves? Because, because all of us have this, this thing in us. That we, all of us have some sort of a heart issue, a, a, a mind issue. And so what's what we're going to be talking about today? Being against the grain of self. Amen? All right. So will you declare it with me as we do here? If you got your Bible, hold it up in your hand and let's declare it together this morning. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It's a lamp unto my feet. And a light into my path. It is my sword against the enemy. I believe who it says I am. What it says is mine. And everything it says I can accomplish. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. You can do all things. All things. All things. We're talking about being against the grain. I like what this video said. We, when we come to Christ, everything should change. We should talk different, think different, act different different, but a lot of us tow um, some of the world with us, and, and there may be some aspects of us that change, but, but there are still those things that we keep that don't change, and so that's what I want to focus on today. The first, uh, the first sermon, we talked about being set apart, that, that we, are, we are, are in this world, but we are not called to be of the world. Amen. We're not called to be friends of the world. The Bible says that uh, Jesus said if you are friends with the world, you are enemies of God. And so we definitely do not want to be friends of the world. Go back and watch that sermon. Uh, and then the second one we talked about, you know that three little little letter word? S E What's the next letter, Miss Rita? X. X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we talked look uh, all, all, all the married people can agree with me right here. Sex is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Amen. Sex is a beautiful thing. Amen, amen. But sex outside of marriage, sex outside of, of God's covenant, sex outside of his word and his command is not a good thing. In fact, it will bring judgment to your life. It will bring bad things. Sexual immorality is not good. And sexual immorality means anything outside of the will of God. Sex outside of the will of God. So if you'd like to go back and watch that one, that's a, that's a good one too. But, but today we're going to take a slight turn. And we're going to focus in right here on ourselves. Starting with our opening scripture this morning. Found in the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, Paul is writing this masterful work of 2 Corinthians, and I, I love it. I'm, I'm going to do it this morning in the New Living Translation because it's just full of color, and I just love how it is said here. Watch this now. Read along with me as I read 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. For God who said, let there be light in darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Listen to what the Word of God just says there. That God spoke light into darkness at creation. And now we have this light shining in our hearts. It's that same power. It's the same glory that's shining on the face of Jesus living inside of you. Oh, how we lose focus of that. We are like fragile clay jars chipped. Maybe some of us broken and, and cracked. 
But that light is shining through us, whether you know it or not. And my hope for you is after this sermon, you're going to have a heart check. Uh, not, a, not, a, not a heart catheterization or a stress test. I'm talking about a spiritual heart check to see what is broken in there that needs to come under the will of God. Amen? All right, so let's pray this morning. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, as we get right into your word this morning, that, Lord God, you will reveal to us through your spirit that comes to convict our hearts, that leads us to all truth, as your word says, that your Holy Spirit will open our spiritual eyes up to what needs to be fixed on the inside. Lord God, as we continue to pray for situations and, and all the things that happen, Father, Help us to recognize that some of that are symptoms of what's happening on the inside. Father, as I preach and teach your word this morning, may it be by the anointing of your Holy Spirit and by the power of your word, all of you and none of me, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Against the grain of self, against the grain of self, Today I want to talk about an enemy, and uh, this uh, is not the enemy that you may be thinking of. The Bible calls the ruler of this world. I'm not talking about that enemy. I'm talking about uh, sometimes your greatest enemy. You know who oftentimes your greatest enemy is? You. Tu. You. Oftentimes you are your own worst enemy enemy. I want you to think back on all the times and all the situations that you have found yourself in. And as you think back and really analyze it, you think, well, man, if I wouldn't have made that decision, I wouldn't have been there. And if I wouldn't have reacted like that, I wouldn't have been there. And in reality, a lot of the the things that we have been in, a lot of the holes that we have found ourselves in, the devil didn't even have to lift lift a finger to get us there. He just simply went, Well, they did that all by themselves. I'll just let them keep on then. Because oftentimes we are our own worst enemy. The Bible calls Satan the devil, the ruler of this world, but he is not the ruler over you. And let me tell you something, he can tempt you, he can rattle you, he can, he can roar, he can, he can form a weapon against you, he can use people to, to try to influence you and come against you and, and get you really mad and get you really angry and, and get you to where you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do something here. You're, but he can't make you do anything because he is the ruler of this world, but he is not the ruler over your heart. He is not the ruler over your decision making. He is not the ruler over your psyche. He is not the ruler over your mind, over your heart, over your spirit. He is the ruler of this world. And so we find ourselves in a situation oftentimes that we were put there all by ourselves. And so what we do is we pray. We say, Lord, change this situation. Get me out of this. Help! Ayúdame, Señor. Help me. Get me out of this. And, And so What we should be praying is, Lord, what needs to change in my life to make sure I never get back here again? A a really effective prayer that I have learned how to pray, really, it took some time, is, is, Lord, free me from me. (laughs) Free me from, from me. Because I know, I know that there are some things that the Lord is still working out in my life. Hallelujah. And he'll still be doing that. All the way to my last day on earth. But the thing, the key is, is every single day I'm getting a little better. Every single day I'm getting a little less dysfunctional. Every single day I'm fearing a little less. Every single day the broken parts in my life are coming together. Why? Because we need to stop putting our focus on the situation, on the things, and focus it in right now. Here, Lord, what needs to change right here? And I know this isn't a popular sermon in pulpits today because we're all like, okay, you speak to that storm, you speak to that situation, name it, claim it, but all along, it's like I'm the one who put myself there. We're so concerned today as Christians about the scenery. Lord, change my scenery. And God is wanting to change our heart. 
hey, change this and change that and change all these people. Change that person. Change my husband. Change my, that's my problem, my husband. Change my husband. Well, maybe he's wanting to change you. Yeah, no, yeah and you don't want to hear this today. You do not want to hear this today. Because I, I was writing it down and I didn't want to write it down. Because the Lord was speaking to me. I'm like, ouch, Lord. Ouch, 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 ouch. Against the grain of self. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about the things that need to be changed in our heart, in our mind, the way that we've been operating. Even if you have been a Christian for 62 years, it doesn't mean that everything you've been doing is right. Dysfunction. You know, that was a word that's fairly new. Did you know that? Dysfunction, the, the, word, the word dysfunction really wasn't s- s- being used until the 19, mid-1960s, This. Dysfunction. What is dysfunction? Ain't working right. Dysfunction. And, and so, can I start here? Can, can I start with dysfunction? Okay? I know none of you come from dysfunctional families. <laughs> can I tell you a story after this sermon? There was a real dear sister of mine whom I love very much. And I, she came to me and she, she, fold, have, she had a folded up piece of paper. By the way, I love it when you, you turn in your prayer requests. You turn those in. They all end up on my desk, and I pray, I pray over each one of them, each one of them. And I just, you, you continue to do that. I'm believing with you in prayer. And so that's what I thought she was doing. She handed me a folded up piece of paper, and I said, absolutely, I'll be praying. Which she said, Pastor, open it. And, and I, I preached this, preach this three-hour message. I'll, tone, I'll, 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 I'll get it to about two and a half today. Uh, and about dysfunction. And, and she, she said, Pastor, open it. And you know what it said? Pastor, my family puts the fun in dysfunction. I'm like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? But the reality is all of us have a little bit of dysfunction in our family. Amen to that? Amen. We all, <laughs> my, wife, my wife said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, thank God, thank God that the Lord redeemed her and brought her over into the Compton family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I, used to, I used to think my family was really dysfunctional. Mark, I, I thought my family was cray-cray, okay? And, and then there, there was this nice family. I mean, they, 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 were, they, they, grew, they grew up, they were right there in the suburbs, nice family. And, and I would spend my time after school there, and, and we'd go and we'd watch Scooby-Doo at this, at this family's house. And they were always so polite and so, so nice, and they would never fight or argue. They, they had uh, family discussions, you know. <laughs> oh, Johnny, we need to sit down and discuss this. Johnny, 7 o'clock. Family meeting tonight, and I thought, that is so cool. In my house, we just let it fly, you know? I like this. I like this. And I thought, I thought, man, they seem so normal. So one. And I would go back and tell my this family, oh, they're so they're. And then I went and stayed the weekend with them. <laughs> yeah, you don't know somebody till you stay at their house a few days. Uh, let me tell you how off they were. So you, were, you weren't allowed at the dinner table, whether breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you weren't allowed to say a word during dinner time, Ron. Not one word. So they, they had about four or five kids there, and no one was allowed to talk. You just eat. You don't talk. You don't talk about your day. You don't ask questions. You, and so I remember my friend Johnny, he, he asked, his, asked his dad a question. Son, you know we don't talk at the dinner table. Eat your food. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> and then I woke up. You know what these crazy people did? <laughs> they gave me water with my cereal in the morning with powdered eggs. No, they weren't powdered. No, they were those egg beaters. Egg beaters with, with, with cornflakes and water. And I thought, these people are psychopaths. I'm going back to my house. You know, we don't, we don't understand. See, all of them. <laughs> Sorry. Well, all of us. All of us have a little bit, uh, a little bit of, of dysfunction. And, and so my question is why? Well, why is there dysfunction in the family? Because, because God started with the family. God started with the family. before It was the very first institution. Before the church was the family. Before the church was the family. 
before the tribes, there was a family. And so Satan, right off the bat, attacked the family, the very first family. And because of that attack, the dysfunction now has, 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 has spread over to every single family in the entire universe, in the entire world. So don't think for one moment that you're the only family with dysfunction because I guarantee you that is not the case. You can read the word of God from cover to cover and the moment you start all the way to the end, you say, man, oh man, these families that God chose are cray, cray, tan locos. They are really, really nuts. I mean, oh my goodness, this makes me feel so much better about my family. I, I think, I, right? <laughs> Novella City, from cover to cover, Dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction against the grain of, of, of dysfunction, against the grain of dysfunction. I, I, I want to, uh, let, let's go to the, probably the most dysfunctional family in the word of God. It's the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The most dysfunctional family in the word of God. And these were our patriarchs. We say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we, we think, you know, just by saying that, that these, these, they were saints. They, they, that family was perfect. After all, God would bring the 12 tribes of Israel out of that family. So they, they, must, have been, they must have had it all together. No. No, no, no. They, they, they didn't. They didn't. In fact, Jacob, Jacob was born into this, into this dysfunction. His mom, Rebecca, his mom, Rebecca, and his dad, Isaac, Rebecca, favored him. Rebecca favored Jacob. There, he had a twin brother. And, and, and his dad, Isaac, favored his twin brother, Harry. That was his name, Harry. I, I know you're thinking Esau, but Esau means Harry. They named him Harry. They really did. The Bible says that he was so hairy. When he was born, he had hair in places that a baby shouldn't have hair. And so they said, hmm, a good name for him is Harry. <laughs> Esau. And his brother, his twin brother, you see, Esau was, was technically born first, but his, his twin brother Jacob grabbed a hold of his heel when they were being born, and, and he came out second. And so Jacob, Jacob, means heel catcher. Heel, weren't they, 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 were, they were so, uh, what's the word? Descriptive, right? So descriptive with their names. Holy moly, aren't you glad your parents were descriptive with your name when you were born? Yeah, yeah. But anyways, and so they were, Jacob was born into this dysfunction. This split home where his mom preferred him over his brother and his dad preferred his, his brother over him. And let me tell you how dysfunction will breed. It will breed and it will continue on and on and on and on. Jacob's mom convinced her son to fool his dad. He said, listen, he's, he, your daddy is, is, is sick. He's dying. He's blind. And he's about to pronounce the blessing of over your brother because he's firstborn. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in there, make him something to eat, tell him that you're Harry, Esau. You tell him that, but mom, I'm not Harry. But, but no, no, you're going to act like you're Harry. But mom, I literally do not have hair on my arms like Esau does. And let, this is how dysfunctional they were. And so, and so his mom said, I'll tell you what you do, son. Don't worry about it. I got it all figured out. There I am, daddy. She told him, you go ahead and put animal hide on you. And when he reaches out and touches, he's going to think, wow, this is, he is hairy. And so he's going to pronounce the blessing over you. This is how dysfunctional they were. And so because that dysfunction continues to breed and dysfunction attracts more dysfunction, Jacob, when he grew up, he went and married into a dysfunctional family. Do you remember that story? Remember when he met a man by the name of Laban, who is actually his uncle? That's weird. His uncle, and he said, man, I'm in love with your daughter. I'm really in love with your daughter, Rachel. So what's it going to do? What, what, what do I have to do to marry her? And what did Laban say? He said, I'll tell you what, you got to work for me for seven years. Seven years. You work for me for seven years and you can marry my daughter, Rachel. Well, he worked for him for seven years. And during that time, you would consummate a marriage in the bed. That's where a marriage was legal. And so seven years, he's worked, he's ready. Hey, baby, you know, we're going to get married tonight. Well, the next morning they consummated the wedding and, and, and Mr. Jacob, you know, heel catcher, looked over and said, 
that's not the sister I was supposed to marry. Because this dysfunctional dad and this dysfunctional family gave him, the Bible says, the homely sister. Anyone know what the translation for homely is in the Bible? Ugly. ugly. <laughs> gave him the ugly. Thank you, Mark. Gave him the, uh, in Hebrew and Greek, it means ugly too. In Spanish, it's fair. It gave, gave him the ugly sister. He, well, he said, wait a minute, this is, not the one I, this is not the one I wanted to marry. And you know what Laban, his father-in-law, said? No problem. Work for me for another seven years and you can marry the one you really... Dysfunction attracts dysfunction. Dysfunction breeds dysfunction. Now, what do you think Jacob's kids look like? Well, 11 of his sons sold their brother into human trafficking. Because if it's not taken care of, it will continue to breed and grow and multiply. God had to remove Joseph by way of slavery all the way to Egypt in order to remove him from that dysfunction. And God has been trying to do the same for you. Remove you from that dysfunction. But the problem is we keep going back to it. What is that thing? Against the grain of dysfunction. We all have one thing. At least one thing. We all have that thing that I bet you could identify right now. All of us. We all do. It's amazing, really. That one thing can tear down the entire house. That one thing can destroy marriages. That one thing can destroy children. That one thing. You can be 95% great, but that 5% can bring down the rest of the house. What is that thing? What is it? All of us have it. All of us have that one thing. And so don't go and turn your nose up at people because you think they are so dysfunctional and you're not. I guarantee you all of you have at least one dysfunction that you have been trying to manage. And that's my point today. You've been trying to manage it. You've been trying to cope with it. You've been trying to glaze it over, but you've got to put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to identify it. You've got to put it under the blood. The Bible says you've got to repent. You've got to change your mind. You've got to ask for deliverance, and then you've got to find somebody to be accountable to that you can share with, and they can hold you accountable and keep you in check. Somebody, somebody that you can trust to do that, but you see, we don't do that we have this, this one thing, and, and what is that one thing? And you can be the, the most talented, the most gifted, the smartest, the most beautiful person, but there is, that, there is that one thing. What is that one dysfunction in your life that has been affecting everything else? Maybe you're a hard worker, a very hard worker. Maybe you work so hard, but you work so hard, and you mow down everybody in your path. You have so much ambition. You work, work, work. You look behind you and there's a bunch of dead bodies. Maybe that's it. What is that one dysfunction? Maybe you have a hard time with telling the truth. Pastor, I don't lie. I just colored the story a little bit. You know, I just exaggerated a little bit. Well, that's lying. Well, what is that? Maybe you're great with people, but you're terrible with money. Or, 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 or maybe you have all the potential in the world. You have all the giftings and all the talent in the world, but you are empty with drive and motivation. What is that one thing that's tearing the entire house down? It's time to quit looking past it, glazing over it, excusing it, and it's time to stop finding an enabler. Oh, Lord Jesus, I told you this is going to be rough. An enabler. Because we, 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 don't like to, we don't like to think about it. We, we just try to get over it. And, and it's, always that, it's always that one thing that we've tried to camouflage. <clears throat> you know somebody that camouflages their dysfunction. They camouflage it with money. They camouflage it with success, with power. They camouflage it with accolades and with degrees. They camouflage it. They camouflage it maybe with their physical beauty. Have you ever met a girl who's so beautiful and then you spend a little time with her and realize she is crazy? <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. I found the girl of my dreams right here. And I don't know. Lord, there's a lot of beautiful people that are crazy because they've camouflaged. They've camouflaged. And you can't camouflage it any longer. 
You got to put it out there. You got to give it to the Lord. Eh, are you honest with yourself enough to identify what that thing is? Are you? Are you honest with yourself? Listen to me this morning. The worst thing that we can do is find an enabler. An enabler is someone who supports our dysfunction. An enabler is someone who makes it convenient for you to not believe God to get better. An enabler. Remember the crippled man at the gate? Remember him, the gate called Beautiful? I, I preached about that about a month ago. Remember that? He was there all of his life. He was born paralyzed. His ankles were twisted. He had never walked a day in his life, ever. And the Bible says that those closest to him would carry him to the gate called Beautiful every single day. They carried him there. They didn't carry him anywhere else. They carried him right there, hoping that their loved one would maybe get a little bit of extra change, pity cash. That they, all, they didn't believe anything bigger for him. That's where they took him day after day after day after day. And it made me think this weekend, it made me think so many of us are carried in our dysfunction. Carried in our dysfunction. It may have been that, that, that your wife or, or your mother or whoever told you about it in the beginning and you got so flared up about it that you, t I just don't want to hear it anymore. And so you closed your ears to it and people just stopped telling you because they know how you're going to react to it. An enabler. An enabler. Carried in dysfunction. Are you ready this morning to let his light shine on it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, then you got to go to the next step and you got you to be against the grain of fear. Because fear is what holds us back a lot of the times. And I'm not talking about being afraid of things that go bump in the night. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm asking you this morning, what are you afraid of? I'm talking about the things that, that terrorize you, like, like being terrified of failing so you don't even try anymore. Like being terrified of, of giving your heart, of, of making new friends. Being terrified. Maybe it kept you away from church for a long time because all you said, oh, those people are just fake. And I, and I know that they're just going to disappoint me just like every other so-called Christian has. It's keeping you back. Maybe you're living terrified of what people may think of you. And so all your life you've walked around trying to please everybody around you. Living to please other people. Can I tell you something? You are not going to please everybody all the time. You got to just stop trying. You got to do what the Lord has called you to do. Walk in obedience with him. Knowing that you are not going to please people all of the time. And after pastoring this church for seven years, I think I've got a doctorate in that subject. I know, I know that with the decisions I make, I am not going to please everybody. And guess what? Every single week I get a note, a call, or something saying, Well, pastor, why did you do that? Well, pastor, why did you make that decision? Well, pastor, I don't... And, and sometime, I, I got to... Can I be honest? honest we're gonna be honest with each other right okay maybe my dysfunction is temper sometimes I want to pick up the phone and say I got an idea for you why don't you go start your own church <laughs> you'll never be able to please everybody Jesus healed he raised the dead he fed he walked on water he lived a life pleasing to everybody. He reached out. He gave unconditional love. He poured himself out in every way. And the crowd still said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So let me give you a word that will set you free this morning. If Jesus couldn't make everybody happy, you certainly won't. Amen. But thank you, Lord. You're not called to make everybody happy. You're called to make him happy. You're called to please him. You're called to obey him. And he is the only one who has died for you. So live your life pleasing him. Amen? And there is often a collision. There's often a collision between obedience to the Lord <laughs> and pleasing people. This is what Jesus said. If the world hated me, they're certainly going to hate you. Because there's often a collision of pleasing people and serving the Lord. You've got to obey the Lord and what he's asking you to do. 
And if people really love you and believe in you, they're going to fall right into line and say, absolutely, I'm going to be praying for you on this. You all right? You good? All right. Well, then let me drive it down a little further. Anybody here um, afraid of um, what ifs? Yeah, yeah, what ifs? This is where I have my big issue. What ifs? What if that happens? And what if that happens? And and what if that? And what if that? And what if that? This is one of the biggest fears that that Christians face every day, right? What ifs? What if this doesn't go right? And what if? And what if? And what if? And and so I was was in Houston this this week. I was ministering in Houston uh, this weekend. And on Friday, I was driving into Houston. And and, and many of y'all familiar with that drive? You're on I-10 and you're driving into Katy. Well, there's construction now. And it goes from like six lanes on I-10 to two. And you know how wide those lanes are? About like this. I I mean, I I even squinched in just like this. I did this. I didn't know if that was going to help, but I I did this. And And of course, of course, of the whole trip, the entire time, my wife calls at that moment. And then I'm driving, listen, I'm driving into a tropical depression that hits me right there. So, what ifs, right? This is how my mind works. If you thought I was a little off before, you're really going to think I'm off because I'm going to let you into my mind. This is how my mind works. Uh, This is how I'm driving. This is how I'm driving. I said, I'm going to (laughs) die. I'm just, I'm being, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here. I'm going to die. I've got to be at the church and minister in an hour and a half, and, and I, I'm going to die. I'm, what am I going to do? It's my wife's birthday tomorrow. If something happens to me every year after I'm in heaven, she's going to think, well, he had to go. I told him not to go. He had to go on my birthday, went off, got in an accident. Every single day I, I celebrate my birthday, I'm thinking about him. I didn't want to go to heaven at that time. I didn't want, definitely did not want to go to heaven with my launch pad, Houston off of I-10, and then this is, I was really going here, and then I, I thought to myself, well, wait, if something happens to me, who's going to preach on Sunday? What's going to, isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> you know the same kind of stuff goes through your head sometimes, but you got to put the brakes on it. You got to stop it. I literally had to say, stop it, crazy man. <clears throat> stop it. I had to change the tune. I had to put on some Christian music and, and I had to begin to go into prayer. And I had to actually go into some repentance for even thinking all of these things. But, but I got to be honest with you, it's, it's why even though I was called to open this church many years before seven years ago, uh, I, I, I wasted a lot of time because I was terrified. I didn't know how to do it. I, I was terrified. Okay, do you want to hear my mind when... <laughs> The day, before, the day before we started our first service, seven years ago, this was, this was my mind. Oh, dear Jesus. No one's going to show up. Well, maybe my wife, a few family members, maybe, maybe, even that's a little, you know, maybe. And, and then what if, what if people do come? Okay, what if people do come and they come and they realize they don't like it? I think I'm going to be a little, a little more hurt than that because they left their church. They like, they like this church and they, no, why did we come here? Why, then they don't come back and I'm going to be even more hurt. Okay, well, what if we go down the road if, a month down the road and we run out of money? Okay, what if we do that and we can't afford this place? Okay, what are we going to do then? So what if we don't have a place to have church and I have no money and I have no people? What am I going to do then? It's been a total total failure. So we're going to be chased out of this place and we're going to have to go find a place and have church outside. And we're, can you imagine we're going to have church with no building? I mean, what, who would come to a church like that? We'll have to go to a park and, and maybe, I don't know, what, what are we going to do? This is how my mind was thinking. And every single one of those things happened. <laughs> every single one of them. <laughs> but you know what? It's all right. I'm a better pastor for it. This is a better church for it. Amen. So stop rehearsing everything that could, that would, that whatever. Stop rehearsing it. Because listen, even if some of those things do happen, he is going to pull you through to the other side. And he is going to build you and stretch you and make you a much better person. Amen. 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 I'm walking a lot because I like my new shoes. They're comfy. 
Son sketchers, yo creo. I don't know what they are. <laughs> Comfy. Terrified. I'm not afraid anymore of that. I'm not afraid anymore of that. But I tell you where I let myself fall into fear, and that was with my daughter just a few months ago. Because I'm at the point. I'm at the point now, you know, whatever happens to me, okay, I'm going to be good, whatever. I, even if the Lord called me home early, I, I'm good. I'm going home. I'm good. I just want to do everything that he's called me here to do, okay? But when it's your ch children, <sighs> Mamas, you know what I'm talking about? Daddies, you know what I'm talking about? When it's your kids, when it's your own kids. Sir, I'm sorry it doesn't look good for your daughter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry she most likely will not make it. You, you know what I had to do there? This is the key. Here's the key to, to this, this point right here. And I know I'm all over the map. I'm sorry. The key, the key is... And you're against the grain of your own fears. The key is remembering. I call it a faith flashback. Remember. So there we were in the waiting room. They were advising us to call a chaplain to pray over our daughter before she died. To have her baptized. We had to sit in that waiting room and go back and remember that we were there in that waiting room, not by accident. She had a doctor's appointment that very day, not by accident. And it wasn't by accident that her OBGYN said, mm, I know you're not scheduled for a sonogram, but let's go ahead and get one. It wasn't by accident. God had preordained all of that. And so I had to go back to that. And I had to realize that he who began a good work in my daughter is faithful to complete it. Amen? I had to go. You have to have a faith flashback. I'm talking about going back to that impossible moment in your life. And you, you thought it was going to kill you. But you came out on the other side. Stronger. Better. Better than ever. And you, you look back and see what God did then. And you know he can do it again. Because he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Because he is the God who sees the end from the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Amen. He sees the credits before the movie is even cast. Two months later. We're sorry, Mr. Compton, your, your baby is aspirating. The milk is getting into her lungs. And I didn't, of all the words in the English dictionary, that's one of the words I hate the worst. Aspiration. And I'll tell you why. Because that's how my father suddenly died. He went in for an endoscopy, aspirated in a simple procedure, and died. And so when they said that, your daughter is aspirating, and we most likely will have to put her on a ventilator, the fear flashback wanted to take over. But with everything in me, I had to have a faith flashback, Jay. And we had been keeping a journal in that NICU of all the miracles. We had 17 so far. So I went back and we read each one of them over and over and over and over again. Because you have to remember. Go back to that place where God was so faithful. This is why, this is why Jesus got after the disciples. Do you remember when, when, when he had fed the 5,000 families? Do you remember that? He had fed the 5,000 families with a sack lunch. A sack lunch, Albert. I mean, we're talking some sardines and two pieces of Wonder Bread. <clears throat> sounds pretty good. <laughs> sounds pretty good. I don't know. And, and I'm telling you what, it was like Papa Do's on that hillside. He, 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 fed the, he fed all of them from one sack lunch. And just hours later, just hours later, listen to this. They're out on a boat. A storm hits, and just like what we do, they forgot. They forgot that they serve a God who is able to change the matter they serve a God, and he was right there. Listen, they were calling him out, Jesus, Jesus, help us, help, like we do, help, help, help. And they, 
Then Jesus is on the water, and you know what they do? It's a ghost. The Bible says they became more terrified because they thought Jesus was a ghost because for some reason that's more easy to believe than it was Jesus coming to save you, Jesus answering your prayers. And there's a scripture that reveals why they were terrified. For they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. I'm telling you, if you remember the loaves in your life, If you remember, the faith flashback will take you back to that moment. Remember the loaves and your heart won't get hardened. You will remember the things that God has already done in your life. And it's why Jesus said, hey, I know you all are full, but go collect all the leftovers. There were 12 barrels of leftovers they put in that boat in order to cause them to remember if he did it then, he's going to do it again. So it's time for you to collect the leftovers of your life, bring them all together, and have faith flashbacks every time something co- occurs in your life. Amen? Every time you are, you are attacked, every time the weapon is formed against you, every time you're driving in a tropical depression and the lanes are six feet wide, whatever the case may be, whatever diagnosis, you have a faith flashback and call it out. Amen? The Bible says, I'm confident of this. I'm confident of this. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he doesn't always tell us the storms along the way. He'll show you the destination, but he won't show you the struggles of getting there. He'll show you the calling, but he won't always show you the storms. When he appeared to Moses, he said, Moses, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're going to lead my people out of captivity. I'm calling you, Moses. You're the one. And Moses was like, how? How? And you know God didn't answer his how? God didn't ask it, didn't, didn't answer his how. He's just, come on. Come on and walk with me. We're going to figure this out together. Because walking in obedience will reveal the details along the way. Abraham, I am going to bless the nations through you. And listen, your children will be blessed. And you will will have a multitude of children that represent every tribe and every nation. And and, and Abraham said, well, how are you going to do this? And, And God didn't answer him. He just said, come on, let's take a walk. So it's time to take a walk. A walk. Don't focus in on the situations, on the details. Don't fo- You just keep your eyes on the prize. Amen. Keep your eyes focused. And in the meantime, when all hell breaks loose, you got to remember. You got to have a faith flashback. Amen. Faith. See, see, fear, fear will overtake your faith every single time. But this morning, I I pray that you are being reminded of what the Word of God says. That the Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. For For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Amen. The worst look on somebody, I'm going to end it here in a little while. The, 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 the worst look on somebody is the look of defeat. Have you ever looked at somebody and they just have defeat on them? And I've, I've, I've counseled a lot of people in that office. People have said, Pastor, the doctor has given me six months to live. Pastor, I was just served divorce papers. Pastor, I lost custody of my kids. Pastor, my son has just been locked up. Pastor, what do I do? And... The look of defeat, the circumstance is one thing, but there's a look that comes upon somebody who believes they're too broken to be fixed. Their situation is far too gone. They are too far under the water to be fixed. So let me leave you with this. How do you go against the grain of brokenness? I'm too broken to be used anymore. I'm too broken to discover the abundant life God has for me. I know, I know through Jesus I've got eternal life, but I've, I've, I've done, I'm done, give, I'm giving up on, on expecting the abundant life. 
I'm too broken. Broken. See, I'm, I'm sure that Mary from the town of Magdala thought that. You know, Mary, we call her Mary Magdalene. Do you know that Mary once had seven demons in her? Seven. Not one. I've seen the effects of one demon in somebody. She was possessed by seven demons. And in that time, there, there, were, there, were, no, there were no facilities. There were no wards, no medication. What they did at that time is they would tie you up to a tree or a post and put you in a cage. Seven demons. And Jesus came across her path. And the Bible says he cast out all seven demons. But I can imagine what the crowd of that town still said. She's still broken. How could God ever use her? And I would have loved to have seen their faces when Jesus said, come on, follow me, Mary. Come on, you are going to be in my inner circle because you are not too broken for this. Do you know that Mary was the very first human being on the face of the earth to see the resurrected Jesus? Not too broken for God. You are not too broken for God. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, thought he was too broken for God. He climbed up on top of that tree so no one else would see him. Chief tax collectors at that time were more despised than anybody in the IRS. Can you believe they're adding 87,000 officers to the IRS? Dear Jesus. Well, anyways, off that topic. So... He was more despised than any IR. He was, dis- he was looked as a traitor, mafioso. He was in the mob. Everybody despised this man. And Jesus came to town, and this man climbed on top of a tree so he could be able to see Jesus without anyone else seeing him. But Jesus saw him and said, you're not too broken for me to come home with you and dine with you. You know what? We're going we're gonna to eat a meal tonight. I bet you Jesus said, cook me a ribeye. Come on, let's pull out the barbecue. Let's, pull, let, let, let's eat because I want to get to know you, and I want you to get to know me. You are not too broken for God. You are not too broken to be used by God. If you think you are too broken, let me tell you this morning, you're actually in the perfect place right now to be used by God. I think about the sinful woman who came off of the streets. You remember her? She came off of the streets and she went in there and interrupted a dinner party with important people. She walked right on in there and everybody gasped. What is she doing here? She is a sinner from the streets and there she is pouring out her red light district perfume all over Jesus. What is she thinking? They criticized her. They mocked her because she was too broken to be in their presence. And Jesus said, leave her alone. And you know what she did? In all of their mockery, you know how, you know, you know how religious folks talk? Can I show you how religious folks talk? This is how that was going on. But, but she didn't stop. The Bible says she kept pouring and weeping. <laughs> pouring and weeping. Pouring and weeping. Because she understood something. That she was just as broken as that alabaster box that she broke in and crushed. She was just as broken. But that, her brokenness was not going to keep her away from all that Jesus had for her. I don't know what state you're in right now. And you may feel like you are the most broken person in this room. Irreparable. I'm telling you this morning, you are in the perfect place. But you got to come to him in your pure heart. you got to come to him in your brokenness and say, whatever is broken in my life, only you can fix it. So I come to you in my brokenness and I pour it all out. I weep. I Listen, don't be afraid of weeping. Tears are good. Don't be afraid of scars. Scars proclaim to the world how Jesus healed you already. You don't be afraid of those things. You don't be afraid of your brokenness. Because we just read in our opening scripture that his magnificent light, the same light that that was shown at creation is shining through your brokenness this morning. So this morning as we all stand in all of our fears... And all of our dysfunction, all of our stuff, all of our mess, 
Do you know why God chose to include so many dysfunctional families in the Word of God? Why? Because there is one central theme in the entire Word. Redemption. From cover to cover. Redemption. Do you know that in order to be redeemed, you got to be redeemed from something? In order to discover redemption, you've got to be in the mess to be redeemed from. It was David who said, you pulled me out of the muck and the miry clay and you set my feet upon a rock. Too broken. No, you're not too broken. The Bible says that he understands. He understands all of your weaknesses. And it reminds me, I'm going to close with this story today. It reminds me of a story that I read A young boy who went into a pet store with all the money that he had been saving up all year long. It was $27.50. He wanted to buy a puppy. He wanted a puppy so bad he couldn't wait to pick out his puppy and go home with his puppy. And he was shown all kinds of different varieties. There was all kinds of puppies. There was beautiful puppies, show puppies. Puppies who could already do tricks. Puppies with pedigrees. But the boy was fixated on one puppy in the back. This puppy was dragging himself. And the boy just watched him. And then the boy asked the pet store owner, how much for that puppy? The pet store owner said, no, son, you don't want that puppy. That puppy was born without a hip socket. That puppy will never be able to run with you, play with you. That puppy will never have the abilities that all of these other beautiful puppies have. No, you do not want that puppy. Choose from all of these other healthy puppies. Choose from all of these other beautiful puppies. Well, the little boy at that moment went to the store owner and he rolled up his pant leg. And he showed the store owner his twisted and scarred up legs. He looked up at the store owner and he softly replied, Well, and it looks like this little puppy will need someone who really understands his weakness and his pain. The boy added, I I need him and he needs me. The pet shop owner didn't think it possible to be more shocked, but he was. When the little boy took out all of his money that he had been saving and said, I want to pay full price for this puppy because this puppy is just as worth any other puppy in this place. That's that's what God said about you. I want that one. I want that one. The world says, no, they're too broken. And God said, no, I want, I want that one. Broken? Yeah. Living in fear? Maybe. Dysfunctional? Definitely. But in the perfect position to experience the life-changing, mind-blowing, heart-mending, supernatural power of a Savior who understands exactly everything that you face every single day. For the Bible says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So the Bible says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The Bible says that he is right now in heaven interceding for you. That's right. You have the best intercessory prayer that you could ever have. Do you want to know why? Because he understands all of your weaknesses. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, Therefore he is also able to save, watch this, to the uttermost. Say, it's time to be saved. To the uttermost. 
The uttermost. I'm talking about the deepest, darkest places of your life. I'm talking about the things that you have kept hidden. I'm talking about the things that you thought God could never change. That's what he means there. To the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is living to make intercession for you right now. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I want you to focus in on him. I want you to not be afraid anymore. No more are you going to live in fear. In all of those places where you feel you're too dysfunctional, that you're too broken right now, I want you to speak peace to it. In the mighty name of Jesus, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. If you are here this morning and you can say, Pastor, I have dealt with all of those things, one of those things, or maybe things that you didn't even list. And today I want to, I want the Lord to take care of it once and for all. I've been trying to cover up this dysfunction and pain in my life, but no more. And if you are ready to do that sincerely now, sincerely, I want you to lift up your hands. It is time right now. Lift them up high. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of your deliverance. There are so many people who their hands lifted right now. And today we're going to pray as we pray knowing that Jesus is interceding for you. And so I want you to come forward. We don't have a lot of room in this altar, but you come forward, you get as close as you can right now if you have your hands lifted. Come on, come on, let's give all this to the Lord right now in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We're laying it all out at the altar today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, come on. you to name it you don't have to do it out loud but you know what it is what is that one place in your life or several places that has been bringing down everything else oh yeah 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 name name it come on what is that place is it fear is it is it an insecurity uh, maybe it's something you've been so ashamed of but today we put it under the blood of Jesus repentance means a change of mind and so we're going to change our mind about how we've been operating in this thing and we're going to ask God to deliver it deliver us from this right now come on you got to believe with me though let it rise Partners, I'd like you to come forward and stand behind them. Stand behind them and just extend your hands out to all of them. Believe with me in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. It is gone. It's gone in Jesus' mighty name. It's gone in Jesus' mighty name. There it is. We're putting it under the blood. We're putting it under the blood in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth. This will not have hold on me anymore in Jesus' mighty name. No more. No more in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. In the mighty name of Jesus. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. Loose her. Enough is enough. 
No more will it hold her down. No more in Jesus' mighty name. Weeping and broken, weeping and broken, you pour out your heart. In the name of Jesus, it's coming out right now in Jesus' mighty name. 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 It shall be. No more. No more will I be chained by this anymore. No more in Jesus' mighty name. No more in Jesus' mighty name. No more. No more. No more. No more. No more. Come on. Rise up. Oh, heart. Believe. Let faith rise up in me. In the name of Jesus. Everything now is coming down. The walls, it's all coming down in the name of Jesus. No more will this thing that has been oppressive haunt you, keep you down in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, and there it is in Jesus' mighty name. I speak to it. Satan, you take your hands off of God's property in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Oh, I want you to just take a bath right now in His presence. Take a bath right now in His presence. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then let's get real, let's get real quiet in here. Real quiet. Real quiet. Shh. We don't have to make noise. Now, right here. Right here. Begin to cry out to him. Right now. You begin to cry out. You begin to speak. What is it that you need from him? It's been way too long. Much too long. You thought you're much too broken. How is it that God could love a person like me? How is it that God could use a person like me? There's healing happening right now in the name of Jesus. Healing happening right now in the name of Jesus. God looked at you. And the Bible says this is how he proves, the present tense proves, this is how he proves his love for us. That while we were sinners, Jesus died for us he saw you broken and wounded in a corner and said I want that one and I'm going to pay full price for them now what I'd like you to do those of you who are here whoever's in front of you I want you to just put your hand on them put your hand on them put your hand on them yeah 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 put your hand on them now believe for them. So let faith believe, yeah. Rise up, oh heart, heart believe. believe. Guys, let, let faith, yes, rise up in me. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. So let faith rise up. Hallelujah. Oh heart, yes, yes, yes. Believe for them. Now you believe for them. The Bible says, pray you one for another that you may be healed. So now we believe for them. So let faith rise up, O oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Let faith rise up, O oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Hallelujah. So let faith. 
rise up, O oh heart, believe, let faith rise up in me. Sing it over again. Hallelujah. Please be still. Say the word and I will set my feet upon the sea till I'm dancing in the deep. Peace be still. You are here so it is well. Even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. Hallelujah. There's such a spirit of intercessory prayer in this place. And I, I just want to get out of the way. These people are being healed right now. People are being healed right now. People are being set free right now from themselves. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord broken, poured out, 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 broken, poured out. How could, how could God love us so much? In all of our messiness and our dysfunction, we, we can hardly love ourselves. And yet there he is. Come on, let him, let him just heal you. Let him heal you right now. Hallelujah. There, there's people in this room that, that, that have been afraid to give their hearts again. how you've been treated and I'm sorry the Lord will never treat you like that you don't be afraid to give him your heart I'm sorry for the abuse I'm sorry for how people have treated you have turned you away and rejected you I'm sorry but I'm telling you right now that you have an Abba Father who will not leave you or forsake you, who sees you right now where you are and loves you so much right there where you are. Walk with Him. Repeat this prayer after me this morning. Heavenly Father, I come to you broken, but poured out with many cracks, with many scars, with many insecurities, with sin, but today, but today, I put it all, put it all under, the under the blood of Jesus. Of Jesus. And, I understand, and I understand, I realize, I realize how, much me, how much you love me at this point right now, that you would send your one and only son to die for me. And so right now, so right now I receive him, I receive him as, my savior, as my Savior, as my everything. As my I will follow him all the days of my life. I repent. Forgive me for the ways I fought. I give you my life, Lord. And all the broken pieces. I give it all to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Lord declares over your life in Psalm, 20, in Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall rest under the shadow of the Almighty. They say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence, and He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart, and you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalk in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. 
You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels to guard you, concerning you, to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone and you will tread on the lion and the cobra and you will trample the great lion and the serpent because they love me says the lord i will rescue them i will protect them for they acknowledge my name they will call on me and i will answer them i will be with them in trouble i will deliver them and honor them with long life i will satisfy them and show them my salvation amen lift your hands for the blessing Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and give you his peace. May you walk in the knowledge of who you are as a daughter of the king, as a son of the most high God. That everywhere you go, his blessing, his abundance, his favor, his divine health, his divine protection, and divine purpose shall follow you all the days of your life in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for joining us online. I hope that you enjoyed service. I also want to invite you to join us here in person. You will notice the moment you walk in through these doors, there is something special in this church. What makes this church so unique, so special? It's the people. You will feel right at home here. We are family here at Compassion Church. In fact, you will walk in through these doors and somebody will find you and say, welcome home. I want to invite you to join us every Sunday here, 9 and 11, 2862 Thousand Oaks here in San Antonio, Texas. I hope to get to meet you soon. Thank you for joining us online. We'll see you next Sunday.